Welcome back to Markets Today. We are discussing the outlook for the year 2021 when it cuts across different asset classes. With us joining us virtually is Mr. Chachilo Gutu, who is the head of research at Genghis Capital. Last week, Genghis launched its playbook for the 2021 strategic outlook when it comes to different investment classes. Um, Churchill will be walking us through the particular tenants when it comes to the macroeconomy as well as fixed income assets. Welcome to the show, Churchill. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bede. Uh, I hope that I'm audible enough. Yes, you are. Uh, so just to walk you through our convictions for the year, uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, uh, we are seeing uh, a growth uh, within our baseline a scenario at 5%. Uh, of course, we are still haven't seen the numbers for 2020, uh, the third quarter growth, uh, but there's some optimism that the last two quarters, uh, there was a bit of some slight rebound from the second quarter numbers, which was quite an ugly print, and 5.7%. Uh, from a uh, demand side of the equation, we are still seeing that uh, uh, consumption, private consumption, is still subdued uh, if you compare it to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we've seen uh, unemployment rates uh, that uh, the last numbers we have, uh, 7%, which is higher than even the average that was there in 2016, which we can use as a pre-pandemic level. And also uh, looking at some of the, there's been, on the other hand, at least there's been some positive sentiment uh, coming from the PMI, PMI, PMI numbers. And there was that uptick that uh, we witnessed in the, over the course of the second half of the year last year, which we expect now could continue this year. Uh, but that said, uh, overall, there's that optimism, um, even supported from uh, uh, the vaccines that are being rolled out not only across the globe, but there's expectation that they'll be rolled out in Kenya, which will be a plus. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the risk that we are seeing is no political noise, uh, which is starting to domin dominate. Uh, comparing uh, the general elections, which we know that it's there every five years, uh, that has been praised by the market. Uh, people, investors, or the, the real sector starts to plan adv in advance. Uh, in regards to this uh, baked in uh, general elections, but not the, the the BBI and the referendum and the politics around that now pretends to bring a major curveball in the market. And uh, September September 1st, 2017, the events around that just tells us that uh, the market tends to be not uh, swayed by any uh, uncertainty. So that is a major curveball that we're seeing in this year. Thank you so much um, for that overview. That is uh, suddenly a well-written report and your conference was well attended and just the, uh, the kind of people that you had, the caliber of investors that you had there as well as the caliber of speakers was quite recommendable. So congratulations to you and the team. Thank you. You're also part of that. So yeah, yes, I was. I'm honored to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I have to take you back to now looking at the GDP outlook because I know there's a number that you had and there's a number that's coming out from Treasury, a number that's coming out from World Bank. And that was a bit of a sticky point, especially in the question and answer session and also some of the panelists when they were making their contributions. So the question question is, as an investor in Kenya, should you really be focused on the actual number, whether it's 5%, whether it's 5.5, whether it's 6.9%, or what is the general trend when it comes to businesses? Will people, do they have the wherewithal to continue consuming? Are they capable of consuming? Is there credit that's flowing into the economy? Should you be making investments in this economy, Churchill? Back to you. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, well, as an investor, perhaps you may not be uh looking intently whether five percent or three percent uh the numbers may not even be uh, commensurate even with the kind of returns that you're looking at as an investor uh but this that uh it it has a trickle down impact into the into the asset classes for instance like uh the equity side uh if there's a rebound in this year we expect that even some of the fundamentals of the company 
will be better as compared to last year. Uh, last year, uh, the risk uh, COVID-19 fallout was a major uh, black swan event, uh, which uh, with some of the companies, a majority of them now not even paying dividends, for instance, and uh, just uh, for them to cushion their buffers because of the uncertainty from COVID-19. So with a rebound, an expected rebound in the year, so that increases the likelihood that these companies will be able to pay even the dividend uh, pay, pay payments. A number, uh, a record number of companies uh, had profit warnings uh, because of their consumption. If you can imagine, some of these companies are relying on uh, people on the sales, and if uh, because of the uh, second round impact of COVID-19 fallout, it had an impact on the sales of these companies which are relying on that. So obviously those, uh, what's happening on the macro funda, macroeconomic space had, has an impact okay. even for an investor. So the, the headline number, be it 3%, 2%, is neither here nor there. As people say, uh, people don't eat GDP, but uh, at least there's some correlation uh, between the macroeconomic and also the fundamentals that investors keep an eye on. Uh, fantastic. I like that. People don't eat GDP, but it is important to just pay attention to the macroeconomy and how that is trending. Perhaps you can give us an overview of then your outlook as a house when it comes to interest rates, when it comes to currency, in, and when also it comes to inflation. What are your considerations when it comes to these th three things? Because they are pertinent if you are looking at the macro of any country that you want to invest in. Let's start off with the outlook on inflation. I'll come back to interest rates later on as we're looking at fixed income opportunities. Over to you, uh, Churchill, on inflation outlook. Yes, on the inflation, uh, we are seeing uh, the headline number. Uh, there could be some upward pressure, at least in the near term. Uh, this is on the back of uh, the reversal of the rate of value added tax uh, from 14% to 16%. So we, we expect it now that impact filter through into the inflation numbers, at least in the near term. Uh, we are still not uh, convinced that uh, co-inflation will, will, will materially move up from where it is. The average, at least in the first half of this financial year, is 2.1%. We still expect it to be within 2% to 3%, just because of the subdued uh, demand pressure in the, in the, in the economy. Uh, so uh, headline inflation, we are seeing it uh, averaging uh, seven uh, close touching 7% levels uh, in this first quarter period. Before now, it's, it, it, it stayed this over the course of the, the other period of the year. So, yeah, just to answer you. Okay, thank you so much. So not nothing too extra on this particular line item, and it's certainly within the bounds of Central Bank of Kenya. Is there an issue when it comes to La Nina? Is the fact that there could be um, a possibility of a La Nina? Is that new information? Is that old information? Should investors be paying attention to this new data? Yes, uh, it will have an impact. Uh, one on the food inflation, uh, it was uh, subdued. It it came down over the course of last last year, uh, pretty much well. Uh, but we're expecting it now to rebound higher uh, in the event that now La Nina becomes uh, an adverse e effect. And uh, considering that uh, close to 30% of the agriculture segment is now crop production, uh, I think that that will be the major impact on La Nina. Now, food is now not performing well as uh, uh, during that cycle of uh, the planting season. So definitely it will have an impact on, on, on agriculture, on the supply side of the GDP, and also on inflation because of the supply uh, disruptions that uh, is, is coming from the agricultural side. So we, we expect it now to have a, an, an impact. Okay, thank you so much for that. What about um, the outlook when it comes to currency? We continue to see a bit of weakening, but last year the weakening was more or less in line with your typical expectation. It's normally 5% uh, give or take in terms of an expectation of a currency weakness. But this year we have the scenario of what has happened in the United States. We have what is happening globally. You're saying there is the reemergence of the second wave of COVID-19. Is there a way to look at or appreciate the currency or in other words, are you telling investors to hold hard currency? Are you telling them to invest in Kenya shillings? Is there a point of caution or a point of opportunity when it comes to currency? 
Oh, yes, uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, you've put it uh, that uh, there's still some witness bias, though uh, one of the panelists uh, in our conference uh, correctly stated that uh, there's a correction. So unlike the weakening, weakening bias, there's actually a correction in the Kenya shilling against the major hard currencies. Uh, so looking at it from uh, the fundamentals, uh, we know that uh, imports have actually been on a, uh, on a, on a back pedal, uh, not only last year during COVID-19, but even pre-2020, 2018, 2019, there's that weakness in import growth. So that somehow tends to have uh, put a lead on a uh, further weakening pressure on the on the Kenya shilling. But you expect that now with the opening up of uh, the economy and also with the gradual rebound in, in the growth that we are seeing, it will now lead to import growth now starting to pick up uh, drastically. And that will now pile pressure on the Kenya shilling at least in the next three months, six months, thereabouts. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, from the local on the on the global front uh, there's uh, uh, depreciation psychology on the dollar uh, whereby now uh, last year they had uh, these massive uh, laws that were enacted by the u.s congress uh, to, to stimulate the economy uh, uh, close, close to 3.7 trillion which is an equivalent of 17 uh, percent of the u.s gdp and right now with the a new administration coming in uh, that was uh, inaugurated last week. Uh, we are seeing another round of a stimulus program, uh, close to $2 trillion. So the impact of this is that uh, with this uh, U.S. being uh, awash with money, it will now lead to some uh, weakening uh, bias on the dollar. So that's the, uh, the general uh, rule of thumb that uh, investors are looking at. Uh, but having said that, there are some nuances that come around uh, investors still look at uh, the US being attractive uh, if, if you look at it from a geopolitical uh, breakdown uh, so US still has that uh, safe heaven uh, it's safe heaven appeal uh, if you start looking at uh, say uh, Europe there's still some risks uh, with the second wave uh, coming from the continental Europe area on the other side there's a uh, brexit uh, which is still uh, 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 uncertainty. Uh, if you go to Asia, there's still some geopolitical risks that are still mopping up there. So you still see that uh, investors are still risk on, uh, on the US and also on, on the dollar. So right now we are seeing even uh, the numbers that, was, that have come in uh, in the money supply locally that they've been uh, in people, uh, locals have been uh, slowly accumulating the dollar uh, hard currencies just because of the uncertainty, uh, uncert uncertain environment that we're still experiencing. All right. Thank you so much um, for that overview of what's happening in the United States as well as the outlook for the Kenya shilling over the next couple of months. Now let's get into the crux of this conversation. That is the interest rates. What is your outlook on this? And maybe we can touch on that, then we'll take a short break. When we come back, we can now look at debt and the fixed in uh, income opportunity sets that you see. But let's start off with the interest rate outlook. Back to you, Churchill. Uh, thanks, um, Bede. Uh, from the interest rate outlook, uh, now the CBR, uh, there's the MPC meeting that is being held tomorrow, but by and large, uh, we and other people who have put out their bills are seeing that uh, there's a higher likelihood that uh, the CBR, that is the benchmark lending rate, will be held at 7%, uh, just, uh, just assessing the whole situation. Uh, but from the point where we are coming from, uh, we know that the CPK, uh, Central Bank of Kenya, and uh, its uh, Monetary Policy Committee has a single mandate whereby, unlike the U.S. Federal Reserve, it just looks at focuses on inflation numbers, uh, where it's uh, U.S. Fed now over and above that, it also looks at the employment number. So with the inflation, we are seeing that it will, there's that upward pressure because of the VAT impact. But having said that, uh, that is a cost push uh, factor. It's not driven by this an increased demand in okay. the economy. So we are seeing that that obviously doesn't lead to a tweak in the in, in the monetary policy stance. Uh, had it been uh, a demand-driven uh, factor whereby core inflation starting to inch up higher, that could have led to some 
some some reaction from the MPC. But because it's a poor cost push uh, factor, we don't think that it will invite any uh, reaction by the MPC. So that's one. And also uh, just doing our assessment, looking at where the economy is at this point in time, uh, we are seeing that there's still uh, there's a negative output gap, whereby the actual uh, growth, even in the current year, last year, this year, we we're seeing that it will still be it will continue punching below its weight, whereby it's below its potential growth uh, that is being seen. So all these factors will just lead the uh, CPK uh, MPC now to uh, have uh, to maintain the uh, CBR rate at seven percent, and of course because of the fragilities in the banking sector, a reduction in the uh, benchmark lending rate. Uh, banks are not lending as robustly. We just uh, ensure that they are still risk on, on the government securities. So that's our outlook on the CBR. And uh, just to preempt your other question on the yield curve, uh, just uh, from the inflation that we expect to be on the upward trend, at least in the near term, that will also lead to um, uh, yields going up. The trend uh, started coming up uh, last quarter, whereby it was mirroring even the inflation trend. Uh, from April up until September, the Inflation was an inflationary trend, whereby uh, the, the subsequent uh, inflation rate in the following month uh, was lower than the previous month. Uh, that's what I mean by this inflation trend for some of our viewers who are not uh, quite averse with these terms. Uh, but now from October to December, we saw that trend reversing with inflation now ending up at 5.8%. We still expect that pressure to be con uh, to continue in the first quarter period, at least in the near term, and that will also lead to yields uh, uh, start uh, continuing that uptrend that started uh, in the fourth quarter period. Okay, fantastic. We take a short break. When we come back now, we can delve into the incidence of uh, debt as well as the opportunities that are available, whether to invest in the short end or the longer end of the yield curve. See you after the break.